Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Sean Coyne. Hi Sean. Hi Joanna, thanks for having me. Oh no, it's great to have you on the show. Just a little bit of an introduction. So Sean is an editor, publisher, literary agent and writer. He's one half of Black Irish Books alongside Stephen Pressfield and he has a book coming out soon called The Story Grid, which we're talking about today. It's very exciting. So Sean, just, just to get started, you've been working with story and authors and books for sort of 25 years. So why this book and why now? Well, the thing is, it took me a long time to learn actually how to do this. Um, and over the years, um, I discovered that there wasn't one sort of text on how to edit a book. Mm -hmm. So I had to kind of develop my own system. So over the, that time, I've published, I've been a part of over 300 books. So I learned a little bit from each experience. And finally, I started using the system uh, probably around 1995, 1996, and that's coincidentally when I started working with Steve Pressfield. And uh, you know, one of the first books that I worked with him on was Gates of Fire. Mm -hmm. And so Steve had given me the manuscript, and I went through it, and I said, "Oh, I'm going to put my grid on it." And he's like, "What are you talking about, grid? What do you mean?" And so over the years, I, I would tell him about the system, and eventually he said, "Just show me what it is that you do internally," because I'd always sort of not use it because I thought nobody would really understand what I was talking about. So I showed it to him one day and he said, you've got to write this book. Um, one of the major things that Steve always says is that writers need to learn how to edit themselves. And I couldn't agree more. So the reason why it's taken this long is, A, it took me a long time to develop the system. And B, I, I was always sort of like, well, whatever I know, everybody knows anyway. So when Steve said it's really important that other people know what you're doing, that's when I decided to do it now. And it's taken me a good, you know, 15 months to, to actually get it all down. And I'm just at the finish line. And as you know, that's when, you know, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because you weren't a, you know, you didn't do cover design or any of that. And I mean, you, we'll come back to the business later, but you're, you're certainly going further than, than it used to. But um, we're going to come back to the grid in a minute because it's really interesting and obviously detailed. Um, but in your years of experience, because of course you mentioned self-editing, which is a skill authors need, but in all your experience, what do novel writers in particular get wrong with story that you wanted to highlight in the book? Well, one of, one of my big things, and it's, it's, uh, it's one of the reasons why I call my literary agency Genre Management Incorporated, and that is writers just are so um, fearful for some reason or um, have contempt for, I don't know if that's too strong, but genre in and of itself. And when somebody says, oh, that's a genre book, people immediately start to think of you know, cheesy pulp fiction from the 1950s, and that is absolutely not the case. Every single novel, every single story, the, genre is just a fancy word for classifying those, you know, myths and great stories that we've been telling ourselves for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So the, the big mistake that, that writers make is they don't embrace genre, and to understand exactly if they work within the genre structures, it will be immensely helpful whenever they hit a, a really bad patch of writing or they're just not inspired. There's a whole series of questions that you can ask yourself that will get you going again. Which you go into, you know, in the book. And behind you, there's actually uh, the clover, isn't there? People can that, see that yes. on the video, uh, which is the genre clover. No, it's interesting. And I, I mean, on genre, I mean, I... I now, in my mind, uh, because I do a lot on online, obviously, genre to me is equal to an Amazon category. What, what would you say to that? Well, I think that's a really interesting point. Um, you know, just to get a little bit into the business of book publishing, years ago when I first started, there was no Amazon, of course, so all the major publishers had to have sort of a farm system of genre writers who, um, you know, they would be managed by an editor. And one of the things that I did to get in was to specialize in mystery and crime fiction. Mm. So <clears throat> when, I, when I started, I would bring in a lot of fresh blood and new, edit, uh, new writers, and I would work with them, and hopefully, you know, they would build up to become Michael Connolly or, you know, James Lee Burke or Robert Crace. And these are guys that I, I got to work with, you know, in, in my early years. And it was wonderful to watch them move up. 
So, you know, back when the digital revolution came about, a lot of that work uh, sort of fell by the wayside at the major publishers. So Amazon wisely sort of started embracing genre again. Mm. And then they started these imprints and they are now sort of the farm system in a lot of ways for a lot of the up-and-coming young writers. So genre does have connotations of crime, horror, love story, all those things, and I think that's a great thing to remember. But it also has um, connotations for inner, internal, you know, plot movements too, like the maturation plot, the redemption plot, all of those things that we think of more of literary writers. Mm those are part of genre too. So um, Amazon has sort of taken the content genre business and, and taken advantage of the fact that the major publishers are no longer in the building game, they're more in the breakout bestseller game. Mm, which is fascinating. We'll come back to your opinion on <laughs> publishing a bit later. But um, let's go into the grid for a bit. I mean, the whole, the book is... I, I don't want to say dense in a heavy way. I mean, it's packed, like packed full yeah. of stuff. So there is no way we can go into everything no. in this interview. So I wanted to kind of tackle some higher level bits. So sure. let's just even go into the concept. So some of the stuff you're saying, you're breaking a structure, you know, into sections. And this, a lot of writers resist this deconstruction of a story. You know, why can't I just write what I love to write and let it flow and blah, blah, blah. So how do we manage that kind of creative side versus your grid and this structure? Well, I would literally uh, think of, of yourself in two very specific ways. And I think you're absolutely right. The writer person needs to be free. They just do. And it needs to be open to being able to flow with whatever it is is coming off their subconscious or, or whatever. So when you're writing your first draft, um, don't edit. Don't, like, don't begin your day by going over what you wrote yesterday. Don't even look at it. And one of the things that Steve and I talk about, Steve Pressfield, who's my business partner, and, as you know, is that you, you, the goal for your first draft is get to the end. You know, work as quickly as you can. Let that brain go any place it wants. Don't worry about any questions about genre or about anything of that nature. Mm. Just move forward. Now, with that said, before you begin writing your first draft, I think it's important to set out a map, a very, very simple form that will give you the highlights and the points where you need to hit like as if you were driving across the United States from New York to Los Angeles, you know, you've got to either go to Ohio or you're going to take a detour and go through Nashville or whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, before you do begin your first draft, I, I created something that I call the fool's cap, you know, story, global story grid, which is inspired from Steve. And it's just a one sheet, sheet of paper that, that outlines some general questions. Now there's only really four major questions that you have to answer before you can start you know, working through your first draft. And that is, what genre do you want to write in? Do you want to write a thriller? Do you want to write a love story? Do you want to write a coming-of-age novel? Whatever it is, just write that down at the top of the page. I want to write a novel about a coming-of-age story. And then what I suggest is do three things. Your beginning hook, your middle build, and your ending payoff. So literally write down what is your beginning hook. For a coming-of-age story, perhaps it would be um, young girl witnesses uh, the murder of her father is the opening inciting incident of a story that's coming of age. Mm. Then you would write down your middle bill. What happens to that girl from the beginning of the story until the very end? Usually I, I would do the, the inciting incident and the ending payoff at the same time and then fill in the middle. <laughs> uh, because the ending payoff has to mirror mm. the inciting incident, right? So the, the great thing about stories, and this is just universal, you know, you want to hook somebody and that hook has to pay off. So the ending of a story has to be inevitable but surprising. So that's generally what a story is. You, you, you hook somebody with a really, a guy walks into a bar and then, you know, at the end you've got to make it inevitable um, and surprising. So that is how I would say to start as a writer. And then with that one sheet of paper, go to town. Write your first draft, let it sail, don't edit yourself. Then 
after you finished your draft, literally like put on a different shirt, put on a hat, put on something, just anthropomorphize the editor self and say, okay, now I'm going to look at this as an editor. And, and the story grid is then, that's the time to take out the story grid because the story grid is going to show you everything that you did right and everything that needs work. So if you've written a great first draft and you don't have to do anything else, congratulations, you know? The story grid is for those moments when you need to take your story to the next level, and everybody wants to do that, or if your story is just a mess. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you really enjoyed the process of letting your freak flag fly and writing that, that big winding thing, but now you've got to come down to terms with the reality of, not, not only, you know, what it is you want to say, but the marketplace. So there, that's how you separate it. You know, when you're a writer, be a writer. When you're an editor, be an editor. Yeah, so many great things there. And I think what's so interesting, because I've, I've got a, a novel here that I've just printed out, and uh, I'm going into that editor mode. And it's so funny because you often, you think you've nailed something, like, well, sometimes you do. But, you know, you're like, yeah, I finished my draft. And then you go back into it and you're like, oh, oh <laughs> no, my, yeah. It's just a nightmare. And so I just wanted to ask you on that, considering how many people you've worked with, and, of course, Steve, who's one of my idols, my, my creative <laughs> idol, um, is does it you know does it get easier and have you seen writers get to a point where they have internalized that grid so that the first draft becomes easier so i for example referring to lee child who famously yes. only writes one um, draft and i think it's because he spent like 30 years in television so he kind of internalized That's that it. so w when does that happen so i can look forward to it <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it will happen the, the, the longer you do it, and you will start to do it intuitively. And, you know, Steve still does the full scap before a project, but I don't think he, he doesn't do it nearly in the detail that I prescribe in the story grid. Or um, The story grid is really, it's, a, it's like an owner's manual for the editor, for the editorial process. So there's a ton of stuff in there that you may never need, and you probably shouldn't even, you know, concern yourself with. But to answer your question, it does become internalized after a while. And I think you're absolutely right about Lee Child. I mean, there's a guy who had to bang out, you know, beginning hook, middle build, ending payoff time and time and time again so that he doesn't think about it anymore. It's a natural thing. Now, the thing about Steve, I'm, it's a very short story about Steve. Um, you know, Steve has written so many great novels. And even him, even he, years ago... Uh, had, had re reached a sticking point. And he had a novel called The Profession, which he had been working on for a couple of years, and he, he just he couldn't crack it. And he had written draft after draft after draft. And he gave it to me, and I read it, and over a few weeks we worked through it, and we discovered, you know, he just he missed a major shifting point in the middle build. Once he saw that, then he could he could finish off the book. So even with the pros, they're gonna, there's going to come a time, and it's usually that book that they're stretching. You know, they're just trying to take it to the next level where something internally shuts down and they forget their core principles. So that's why the story grid and editing is such an, a useful tool mm. is that it will it'll walk you off of the bridge. It'll, it'll get you back to reality. Mm. Your story has a problem there's a solution. All you have to do is find those problems and you, eventually you'll fix them. It's, it's, it's just makes that much sense. Mm. The trouble is finding the problems and that's what editors used to do in, in, in book publishing and they had a lot of time to do it. They don't have that time anymore. So you have to learn how to edit yourself. Yeah, and, and find that. And it's, it's so interesting you say that. And I found as I've mapped out, and Scrivener, I use Scrivener, I know you know about that. And I've been using the notes on the right-hand side to kind of ask the questions, to, to do an overview and then see the polarity shift or the value change. And I wondered if you could talk about that, because I only learned about that recently at a Robert McKee um, seminar, as he right. talked about this value, um, story values and the positive and negative charge. And I was so interested that you talk about this as well. Um, and it was a real penny dropping moment for me. So I wondered if you could particularly talk about that, you know, what story values are and how to use them in that, in that kind of breakdown. Sure. Um, story values are very simple. Um, they're positive or negative 
things in our lives. So for instance, life, death. And there's a polarity shift from life to death. There's life, there's unconsciousness, there's death, and then there's the fate worse than death, which is damnation. So there's sort of like this spectrum of, of, of the life-death value. Uh, for instance, justice. Justice has the same sort of thing. It has justice, unfairness, injustice, and tyranny. So these are, these are the values, um, you know, hope, despair. These are the things that we all think about in our lives that we, we are constantly emotionally affected by in our everyday life. We just don't, you know, think of them so clearly and rationally. But when you're a writer, you need to do that. And the reason why you need to do that is that um, the writer, the, the, the primary you know, unit of story for a novelist or a screenwriter is the scene. Now, the scene needs to have a value at stake. Now, that doesn't mean it has to be the exact value of the global value at stake for uh, a specific genre. For example, the global value of, at stake for a crime novel is justice. Are they going to catch the criminal or aren't they? Mm. So you can have a, a crime novel where a scene within that novel has nothing to do with justice, but has everything to do with, say, hope, despair. So the beginning of your scene, you would want to be at one side of the spectrum. Hope. You know, your uh, detective is hopeful that this lead is going to encourage and lead to another lead and eventually lead to the solving of the case. Hmm. So that's how you would begin that scene. And then at your turning point in the myth, something has to happen where his expectations are not met and he reaches a level of despair. So that's a scene that makes a lot of sense because it's moving from a positive at the very beginning of, this, of that scene to a negative charge at the end. So the reader is, you know, oh, wow, this is great. This, this, this clue is going to pay off. Oh, no, it doesn't. Oh, it's terrible. I wonder what's going to happen next. next. So that's the polarity of shift that can keep the reader engaged. If you, if you don't, first of all, if you never shift a value in a scene, it's not a scene. It's exposition, it's fancy writing, it's a lot of things, but it's not a scene. A scene moves a value from one to another, mm -hmm. from a positive to a negative, a negative to a positive. It can go negative, double negative. It can go positive, double positive. You win the lottery and you're getting married, you know. <laughs> or the That's opposite. usually the start and then it gets worse. <laughs> <Right. laughs> <laughs> well, in in my in lot, my world, <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, anybody can take that any way they want, but it has to move. So, uh, Bob uh, Robert McKee is a client of mine. So, there's a reason why, you know, I've been I've been studying Bob's stuff for years. I've known him for 15 years. Uh, he's a one. He's a, like I. My goal is to download everything that Bob knows about storytelling into books. Mm. And we're working on a, a book right now together on uh, dialogue, which oh, is wonderful. fantastic. I'm fantastic. so looking forward to that. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that, that you were working so closely with him. No, I, oh, yeah, yeah. amazing guy, real performer. Just... Oh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, oh. that, that movie, that, mm. uh, what was it called? Adaptation, Adaptation, where Brian Cox plays him. He's fantastic. And he, he nails Bob perfectly. <laughs> But um, you did you mentioned screenwriting there, and of course Bob teaches about screenwriting, and I'm fascinated by this, and I want to write a screenplay mainly because you it, ha it has different aspects to it. Should novel writers, in particular, write screenplay or at least try because it helps you with this type of thing? Oh, absolutely, I think so. Beyond the fact that. Um, you can't really bullshit in a screenplay mm -hmm. because you've got to turn a scene or it just sits there on the page and nobody understands what's going on. The, the wonderful thing about writing a screenplay is you have to think visually because um, dialogue and exposition is not allowed. So, I mean, dialogue, of course, is allowed, but exposition meaning how somebody felt or somebody mm -hmm. looked or you can't have that in a screenplay. So it makes you boil down whatever it is you're trying to say into visual terms. Now, some of the best writing captures visual life. Mm. 
So, um, for instance, if somebody says, how was your day today? You say, oh, it was good. That doesn't really mean anything. But if you say, oh, it was wonderful. I, I met this really, really sweet person who we went to coffee at, you know, that coffee shop that has the ferns, you know. So if you can describe things visually, then that visual presence reaches the reader's minds. And that's so to practice writing visually and to think visually, writing a screenplay is going to be extraordinarily helpful. Mm. And yeah, I mean, just on the adapting novels, I mean, obviously, Stephen Pressfield started with screenplays and moved into novels. Um, if one has novels, like, like I do, for example, uh, would you recommend adapting? I mean, I'm looking at one of my novellas because obviously the, the length as well is much right. shorter. You know, should one adapt and give it a go or is it best to try and write something from scratch? Well, it, it depends. I, I think um, the tricky part about adapting your own work is that, and this, is, this happens in Hollywood a lot, a lot of my clients will write a terrific thriller and then you know, a studio or somebody will want an option and then my client will say, can I, can I get a shot at writing the screenplay? And Hollywood hates that. Oh, yeah. You know? They want yeah, the writer just, gone, right? <laughs> exactly. Beyond, beyond the fact that they want the writer gone, it usually ends up where the writer has a really strong vision of what he or she sees and um, they can bring it to, to bear in the novel, but the screenplay becomes a little muddled mm. and um, it doesn't seem to have a strong, as strong a point of view or, or strength as it does in a novel. But what I would recommend is to find... Uh, a contemporary's novel or a short story and think about adapting that or create an original screenplay. Mm. Um, adapting your own can, um, you know, it can work. It really can. I mean, uh, Gone Girl was, was adapted by the writer of... Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, terrific. I mean, a great book, great screenplay. Mm. She's doing more and more screenplays now. Mm. Um, but, you know, she's, she wrote three novels before she did that, or yeah. two novels. So she, and she was a journalist for years, too. So, again, it's like the Lee Child thing where these people have been doing these hoax builds and payoffs for so long that eventually it becomes, you know, almost automatic and within themselves. So mm. I, I don't think I'm answering your question very well, but it, yeah, is, it, can, it can get tricky to adapt your own work because mm. you fall in love with certain things and you can't let them go. No, it's, it's funny because I've been to a few screenwriting festivals and I've been learning about this. And the thing that stops me, I think, and, and you know, Steve Pressfield talks about it, is you, you can write screenplays and if, if nobody buys them, even if they do get bought, they might not get made. You might never make any money out of a screenplay. But now, of course, with self-publishing, if you write a novel that's, you know, even halfway decent and you get an editor and you get a cover, you can still make money out of a novel. Whereas yes. a screenplay... Most of them just seem to sit in drawers. <laughs> they do. They really do. I mean, I, I also um, represent David Mamet, who oh, has... Okay, yeah. Who self-publishes now, right? Uh, he, he does occasionally, but um, he was just recently published by Penguin, too. So he mm. loves... Um, he it's loves all. Hmm. Yeah, he is. He is. But, you know, he's had 25 things produced, and he's probably written 50 screenplays. Mm. And the other ones are just, you know, they've been bought, and they're sitting some, in some I'm vault. Sure. So... That can get a little depressing, too. <laughs> yeah, I hate that thought. Um, so let's come, come back to uh, the breakout idea. So I mean, you mentioned that you've worked with some of these breakout mystery writers, um, you know, and one of the other things in the book is about emotion. And I wondered if, if perhaps you could talk, well, does, being, does having a breakout book mean that you have tapped into some emotion or what are some of the things that you see amongst the books that have broken out in terms of elements of story? <clears throat> well that that's a really great question and that is that's the million dollar question in book publishing and it was one of the things that they entrusted me to do at Doubleday and when I was there years ago and to varying degrees of success mm -hmm. but I will say this and I'll, I'll use an example of a a breakout book that I worked on uh, with Robert Crace, which was L.A. Requiem, and this was mm. back in 1998 or so. And Bob's like number one New York Times bestseller now. But at the time, he had written this wonderful book featuring his recurring character, Elvis Cole, and it also had 
um, Joe Pike, his his second sort of major character. But Joe was sort of um, a little bit lost in the background. And he was transitioning at the time, Bob was, from making his lead character less, you know, sort of really smart and, you know, kind of uh, cynical to uh, a deeper, deeper character that people would follow from book to book. So um, the thing that we needed to do was uh, take, you know, the value in the thriller, in the crime story, to the negation of the negation. And I've written about this recently on Steve Pressfield's blog. But the negation of the negation means is to take the story to the very, very limits of human experience, to the end of the line, to the point when there's no turning back, the lead character's going to be forever changed, his life seems to be in a shambles, and he has to pick up the pieces and, and deal with it. And as I write a lot about, Stories are about change, mm -hmm. and, and none of us likes change. We all like our routines, our habits. It's all when things are working well for us, and we can just do this, that, and the other, we feel okay. But when we're challenged, we have to move. If something terrible happens in, in our life, and we've got to completely change who we are, we don't like to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's why people love stories, is that when you can read a book, and you can attach to a, a protagonist who is going through the same sort of similar emotional turmoil that you do, then you feel, oh, well, you know, maybe I can get through this move. You know, if, if Elvis Cole can get over the death of the woman that he would, you know, die for mm. 25 times over. So um, when, when we did work on that book, we, we, dis we discovered that we needed to take Cole to the end of the line, which was a level of damnation. You know, would an action that he makes damn himself or, you know, and th that brings in the villain, you know, of course, mm -hmm. too. But um, so it, it's, it's interesting that you brought up story values earlier because that is really the answer, answer to the riddle is to understand the core value of the genre that you're writing on, writing in, mm -hmm. and taking it to the end of the line. Mm. So um, I, I could go on for hours about the negation of the negation, and I know that Bob covers it very well in the story. Um, but it's it's really important if you want to write that breakout book that people are going. And I mean, one of my all time favorites is Silence of the Lambs, and mm. that is what I analyze in the story grid. And what's so remarkable about that book is that Thomas Harris takes the book to the end of the line by the midpoint of that novel. And so you are so emotionally attached to those characters that, you know, reading the last half of that book, you, you stay up all night. You can't help yourself. And that's the goal. Yeah. And, I mean, you talk, the negation of the neg negation uh, I, confused me quite a lot when, um, yeah. you know, and, and it's a, it can I think, be you know, it, like when we say life, death, damnation that is a kind of obvious one um but you can't use obvious ones every time so in the in your book the story grid do you actually give a nice list <laughs> of positive negative and then the negation of the negation yes. okay yes the, the the most important thing is that um when we were talking earlier about the story values in scenes you don't have to go to the negation negation in fact if you do you're gonna it's going to seem back. melodramatic. <laughs> yeah. It's going to seem mel it's going to seem like a soap opera. Mm. But in the core value, meaning the overall value of the genre that you're working on, you need to mm. for a breakout book. You don't always have to. In crime stories, there are wonderful mysteries. Agatha Christie never went to the negation of the negation. Damnation was never in play because we were we were enthralled by her inspectors figuring out Miss Marple or Poirot. Mm. We were dazzled by their erudition and how smart, how are they going to figure this out? They're the master detectives. Mm. Same thing with Columbo. Those stories never go to the negation of the nation. But if you want to write a breakout thriller that Hollywood's going to buy, mm. if you want to write The Silence of the Lambs, which is the preeminent serial killer thriller, uh, I mean, he wrote Red Dragon. Mm. I mean, he, he basically invented the serial killer thriller and then he made it even better with Silence of the Lambs. So, if you want to write that kind of story, the core value of the thriller is life-death, as it is in action or in a horror. Mm -hmm. And horror and, and crime and uh, makes a, an action make the thriller. Anyway, I, I could go on 
but um, but the thing to remember is that um, the negation of negation in the core value is what will give you the opportunity to write the breakout book. So if you're writing a love story, the love story, like say um, Judith Guest's book, Ordinary People, the negation of the negation in that love story is um, is love masquerading uh, or hate masquerading as love. Mm-hmm. And if you remember that story, the mother hated her son for s- surviving the the terrible accident, and the other son that she adored died. But she would never admit that. She never admitted it to herself. Mm-hmm. So by the end of that story, she is so unwilling to admit that she does not like one of her sons and adored the other that she's willing to leave the family. And that rips our heart out because we can understand that self-deception. And um, so that's, that's, there's a very small, uh, not a small story, but a very, you know, sh- confined story set among three people that goes to the negation of the negation that is a breakout book and rips your heart out. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to write The Silence of the Lambs. If you can write Ordinary People or anything like that, or it's Sophie's Choice, I mean, there's, <laughs> come on. Yeah. I mean, you, you can go into the literary world the same way as you do as the crime fiction world mm-hmm. uh, and thrillers and everything like that. So Yeah, and I yeah. think for people listening, this is much more complicated than one thinks it is initially, you know, as in that there is so much to this and and it's fascinating. So I urge people to check out The Story Grid, the book, and also your website, uh, thestorygrid.com, right? Which That's correct, yes. Yeah, has got a lot more detail about this. So, um, but I wanted, before we, before we go, I wanted to ask you just a couple of questions about the kind of entrepreneurship side. Um, Sure. Because you and, and Steve Pressfield have a company called Black Irish Books, um, and your motto is get in the ring, which I really like. Um, so <laughs> tell us, why is that the motto and, and what does that mean for, for writers? Well, um, the motto is, is basically to encourage people to fight what Steve and I call the inner war. And the inner war is that thing that he talks about and writes about in The War of Art, which I edited and published 12 years ago when I had an independent publishing company. So we started Black Irish Books when The War of Art came free from a major publisher who was reprinting it. And we said to ourselves, you know, let's start this own, this little company, we'll call it, and Steve came up with Black Irish Books, I won't take credit for that. It's because I'm Black Irish and I get very passionate and he's been in meetings with me where I'm way too passionate. So, uh, so he thought it would be very funny to call it. But get in the ring means if you have something that you know you're supposed to do, and we all do. It might be, you know, gardening. Do it, you know? You've got, you've got to push yourself into places that make you uncomfortable. And um, so getting in the ring isn't about beating up anybody else. It's not about fighting with people. It's about fighting the inner war. It's fighting within yourself to beat down the voice inside your head that says you can't do it, you're a loser, forget it, nobody's going to care. I mean, these are all the things that I face when I'm writing the story grid, everything that you face that you, when you write. So being an entrepreneur is exactly the same thing. You, you, people are going to tell you, oh, you're crazy, you're never going to make any money doing that. That's silly, that's a waste of, what are you doing, podcasts, who cares? So you can hear that until you're blue in the face, but the reality is, is that it's not, it's not the, the, uh, the gifts of, of being a business person or how many people buy your book. It's when somebody says to you, you know, I saw that, I, I listened to that podcast that you did and it really, you know, it made me think about the things that I was doing in my own. That's the stuff that we do it for. Mm-hmm. And so that is what you need to remember. That's what fighting the inner war is about. It's not about getting, becoming a millionaire or a billionaire or whatever. It's just, trusting yourself enough to do what you know you should do. Mm. And then, and how does that then relate to publishing? Because you've worked in big publishing, you've had your own press, you have the company with Steve. Um, you guys, I mean, you wouldn't call it self-publishing because you have a company and everything. Yeah, it's but it's, yeah you guys are indie. Like, this is it. Yeah. This is all I mean, This is this whole black space. That's it. That's so, all I, mean. I mean, you've really shifted in your career. What do you think of, 
right now in pub in the publishing world you know what is your opinion of, of the kind of indie space and, and where are things going well i th i think there's always going to be major publishers and and there should be i mean major publishers are terrific in, in certain things and not so great in other things and i left major publishing because i'm i'm the kind of person who has a wild idea and i want to run with it you know i just want to i want to try it let me try this marketing thing and the thing at a major corporation is that every once in a while they go, okay, coin, go ahead and try that. But most of the time they're going to say no. And they have to say no because they've got to manage hundreds of employees, billions of blah, blah, blah warehousing and sales reports. And, and so it got to a point in my life when I was there to say, you know, this, this really isn't for me. I should be on the outside. I shouldn't be on the inside. And there are tons of committed editors and marketing people, and there's wonder. I, some of my best friends are still in major publishing, and that's cool. Um, and there will always be a place for them because they've got the ability to jam a book into the marketplace, and if it's great, it can become a huge bestseller. Well, look at the Goldfinch. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a great book, and you know, if that was independently published, it would have a difficult time finding a market. It really would. <laughs> yeah. So um, there's always going to be a place. Now, independent publishing, I think, is really, really uh, a wonderful opportunity for people who are just not going to get any love from the big five. And that's pretty much everybody. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, there's probably 8% of people who write a novel are going to find an agent and those agents are going to be able to place probably 70% of their stuff because they are very selective and they have to be. Mm. And even of those, even getting say a hundred thousand dollar advance for your first novel sounds great, but it took you seven years to write it and it's going to take another two years to publish it. And if the book doesn't perform in its first 12 months, the second novel isn't going to excite anybody at the big pot five publisher. But if you're independent, you can publish your first novel in September and publish your second novel in October. Who cares? In fact, that's a pretty good idea because anybody who likes your first will want to have your second immediately. Yeah. So there's so many different marketing and fun opportunities, and you take advantage of all of them, Joanna, and it's great to watch and to, to follow you because you're constantly doing and trying different things, and you're having fun, and you're doing, different, you're doing nonfiction, you're doing, still doing your fiction, that's a great, you, you think about your world in terms of projects more than mm. affirmations from third-party validation sources. Mm. And when I say that, I mean like a lot of people need to be published by Random House. Yeah. It just makes them feel like, okay, my world's okay. I've got Random House on the spine. That's fine. Other people don't. And I don't need that, and Steve doesn't need that any longer. And, mm. and, but, but it's okay to be there, too. Um, but I think independent publishing is great because you can build your own platform, you can talk to your peeps, they can buy your stuff directly, which means you don't have to sell as many copies to make a living, mm -hmm. which means you can do your next project and then do another one, and you're not sitting around waiting for somebody else to pick you and say, oh, you're, you're worthy. Instead, you're building your own tribe of people who think you're terrific. Mm -hmm. And the more people who do that, the more people who read, the better it will become. And eventually... I can see independent publishing being a global marketplace more than just the specific. So translation rights, I mean, the thing about selling translation rights today, and I'm sure you know this, is that you often do a deal with a foreign publisher. They translate the book. They give you $500, and you never hear from them again. You never get any sales figures. You, ne you never build an audience in that country. Now, we have the technology. It's crazy not to be able to have your own website in Czechoslovakia you know, being translated. Mm. And that's only a matter of time for that to happen. So you can build multiple audiences around the world and increase the scale of your operation independently. And you can do your own marketing. And nobody's there to tell you no. And that's the great thing about being independent is nobody's going to say no. If you have a crazy idea, you can do it. Try it. It might, it might not work, as Seth Godin always says. This might not work. So what? Try something else. It's fun. Make it fun. Yeah. 
it's so good it's so good talking to you and steve and people in the tribe you know like the seth godin <laughs> tribe like we're all so positive and happy and <laughs> we love it uh, which is awesome because this is fun and you know i'm enjoying it you're clearly enjoying it and um i the, only, the people i worry about are the people who are not enjoying it and right you know maybe because maybe I, they should be gardening yeah, maybe they should be. But this is so interesting because I used to think, probably up until about a year ago, I used to think that anyone could be an indie author. I really did. And now I'm not so sure because mm. everything you've said is true. And you do have to have this kind of attitude and this entrepreneurial spirit of giving it a go. And if it fails, hey, whatever, do something else. Right. Um, resilience to do this. Um, so do you think anyone can do it or is there a personality type? Uh, I, am with you. I mm. think I used to think that, and I used to think, um, um, that if I made the right arguments to people, you know, I'm speaking as a literary <laughs> agent and an entrepreneur myself. And I, sometimes I have crazy visions for, for certain people and saying things like, well, you should do this and I'll help you. And, and and, and, you know, it's not for everybody. Mm. It really isn't for everybody. And that's all right. You know, it's okay. Uh, everybody doesn't need to be testing the waters all the time. And the one thing I would say is that you don't have to do everything. You know, like you, you're a mad woman. You do everything. You do positive. <laughs> I mean, it's great. But I, I, I can barely get the website posts up sometimes. So, but instead of not doing it, it, it comes to a point in your life where not doing it is more painful than doing it. Mm -hmm. So that's really where it, you said at the very beginning of this podcast, why now? You know, why? Well, it got to the point where not doing the book became more painful than doing it. And so that's why I'm downloading everything I've learned so mm -hmm. that maybe the 26-year-old Sean Coyne who's out there now can, can have a resource that it took me 25 years to figure out. Um, and that would have been immeasurably helpful to me 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really, it comes down to that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not for everybody, no. And, you know, could I get some major publisher to publish my book? Maybe, maybe not. But it doesn't really matter um, because it's, it's important to me and it's what I've got. It's not for everybody. If you like it, great. If you get nothing out of it, throw it away. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't imagine anyone not getting anything out of it. I'm in the queue, certainly. And and actually, just on the launch, because uh, you and Steve also do audio and video. And at Black Irish, you have uh, launches that are not necessarily based on Amazon. So I've bought audio books directly from your website, right. which I love. I think are amazing that you do that. So you're really going that entrepreneurial route and cutting out the middleman and all the things that we talk about. So um, tell us where we can find the story grid when it'll be launched and will there be some uh, multimedia extras that we can look forward to? Absolutely and, and that's one of the things that's taking a little extra time because we're uh, we have a wonderful artistic director who's, who's putting together a lot of the grids and the maps because I'm, I'm a visual person as well as a you know a word person mm. so that's that's the thing that I love about the story grid is that you see the entire you can see the novel mm. as opposed to having to go page by page so, um, yes, we're going we're gonna to be doing, um, in fact, I'm going to L.A. next week to meet with Steve, and we're going to film a whole bunch of stuff to talk about it. We're going to launch early March. I'm thinking Ides of March would be a good time yeah. to launch this thing. So, and we're going to include all kinds of, um, you know, goodies that we haven't quite figured out yet for the tribe. Mm. So what, what the tribe means is anybody who subscribes to stephenpressfield.com or thestorygrid.com is going to get a leg up. And you're going to get a deep discount on the first batch of books um, because you've put up for so long waiting for it. Um, and you'll get a whole bunch of goodies, too. So um, the videos we're going to shoot and we'll do a YouTube thing. Um, that's the other thing that people always forget and the major publishers always forget. There's, you can promote any time. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as a pub date, a no, launch no. date. There really isn't. There's just no national media anymore. So the, the big five publishers are, oh, our pub date, uh, you know, it's going to launch and we'll have two-week blitz of media and then that's it. And that's literally all they do. 
Mm-hmm. But Steve and I look at it like, hey, we're in this for the long haul. We've got stuff that we've planned for books that we published two years ago that's going to come out eventually. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, we are, we're overwhelmed with ideas and content. So the, the short answer is yes, we're going to have lots of video stuff. March 15th is, is the date. It's going to be on sale for, the, for probably Amazon people. And the tribe will get it a little bit earlier at a cheaper price. I'm excited. I'm in the tribe and I hope everyone listening will now become one. <laughs> it's exciting times. Okay, so uh, just tell everyone the website uh, again, just so everyone knows. Sure, it's www.storygrid.com. Fantastic. Thanks so much for your time, Sean. Thank you. It was wonderful. Great to talk to you.